Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast. Coming up, been invited, and I said, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna climb it barefoot, and I'm gonna give it a bit of a, an identity. I'm gonna call it Barefoot Warrior, make a nice little logo on a website, and see how it goes." And it raised nearly seventy thousand pound, and and they walked alongside me, and they raised, you know, a thousand pound, I think, or two thousand pound, but a significantly lot less, but still an, an amazing amount of money. And I thought all I did was the same as them, but with no shoes on. And I thought, so you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to have this super profile. You, you don't have to be a celebrity or anything like that to raise a lot of money. You've just got to think outside the box and, and do things differently. My next guest is a former soldier best-selling author and an extreme adventurer. From his expedition, Running Dangerously, which was running a marathon in Afghanistan, Iraq and Somalia, to paddleboarding around the UK. He is also the host of the Channel 4 series, Hunted. And today on the podcast, we talk about a number of his trips and about why he does these extreme adventures. So I am delighted to introduce Jordan Wiley to the show. No, oh, thanks for having me. A pleasure to be here at last. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been uh, quite a few a few attempts, but I mean, absolutely amazing to have you on. Uh, what I absolutely love about your story is the sort of transition from the army to what you're doing now, and sort of inspiring so many people. Let's sort of go back to the beginning. Um, how did this all sort of start for you? You know, for me, I'm, I I grew up in Blackpool um, in Lancashire, and and I guess. You know, to, if I'm being completely honest, it was joining the military was really sort of a lack of other opportunities um, at that age of sort of 16 years old. You know, I, I'm, I'm not too proud to say that I left school with no qualifications. Um, um, I, you know, I, I really didn't apply myself. And that's something I I try to share those lessons with young people today because I, I had the opportunity to, to, to go to education, but didn't you know put the effort in. And what I, you know, later learned in life is that actually to have the opportunity is a privilege in itself, uh, unlike a lot of children around the world. But, you know, I, I, I learned that lesson and, I, and I, I certainly tried to share that lesson. But very proud to say, actually, that I went back to education as a soldier in the army and did my I did a bachelor's and a master's degree. So sort of turned it around and, and you know, owe a lot to the, the military for that, that that opportunity in itself. But, yeah, I joined the army at 16 um, because I didn't have any qualifications. I ended up again with limited options inside the army so my opportunities were really join the infantry or join the royal armored corps which are both the two fighting units if you like or the fighting arms of the uh, the british army so um, i joined a tank regiment uh, and i spent the next 10 years there really um, i had lots of great experiences traveling around the world uh, obviously took part in different operations in places like iraq and northern ireland and you know really i i, I think got to Got to grow up quickly and got to understand, you know, uh, for me, real education I learned in the army is about meeting people and traveling to different places. That's where, you know, really gives you solid grounding, I think, in life. But also I learned values. I think the values and standards of the British Army are probably what sets them apart from from most organizations in the world. You know, we we sort of live and breathe our values of, of courage, uh, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, discipline, selfless commitment. And those core values are integral to, you know, to being a soldier and, and still the same values. In fact, that I carry, and I've left the army 10 years ago, but they're, they're still the same values that I try to uphold and carry every day now as a civilian, because for me, I think they're, they're probably the, the best decision-making tool that I ever, ever gained in life, you know, because you always know if you're doing right or wrong because you 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 question and hold yourself accountable to your, your values, I think. And and that's what the military was was really good at. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle when they come out of the forces because you lose that that, that sense of belonging, that sense of, of pride, that sense of purpose. And I think you have to sort of try to cling on and, and remember those values because that's also what's going to pull you out and, and keep you going and, and pushing forward. Um, but yeah, 10 years in the army and then left the army. Um, I spent five years in the private security sector, sort of dealing with piracy off the off the east coast of Africa, off Somalia, um, dealing with the, the, the piracy threat between sort of 2009, 2013, 14. And then really from then, it's been for the last six or seven years, I guess, a life of adventure. Um, obviously, lots of 
twists and turns along the way. But I think, you know, we all have ups and downs in life. Um, I've certainly, you know, I speak quite openly about things like mental health. You know, I've had my, my low points. I still take medication for, for depression, anxiety today. Um, but try to stay positive. Try to have that, I guess, that growth mindset that, you know, that, that and these days I try to, try to find positives even in what would be perceived negatives as well, you know, whether that's lessons or, or you know, things to change for next time. So, you know, it's, it's been an incredible journey so far with, you know, lots of twists and turns, as I say. Well, let's, let's sort of get into it because you were in Somalia, you sort of, you were there for quite a bit of time. And then afterwards you decided to sort of run marathons in all these sort of war-torn areas. What was the sort of purpose behind doing these marathons? Yeah, the marathons, um, you know, the, the 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 project was called Running Dangerously, and it was it was really about going back to places that I'd either worked in or served in as a soldier, and and highlighting the plight of the children in these places because you know, as a soldier, I think I was always able to process the some of the hardships we went through. You know, losing friends, losing colleagues, which is obviously absolutely tragic, but I. I, I, I was always able to understand that because it was part of life as a soldier. You know, you 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 go to war, and unfortunately, bad things happen, and and you have to deal with that. But what I always struggled with was was seeing children injured, hurt, maimed, whatever it might be, and that was something that I, I, I struggled to process because I think for me, children are always the innocent victims of a conflict when one breaks out because there are. The victims of circumstance, you know, an adult can can normally leave the country, leave the region or choose to stand and fight, you know, if they're in a war, whereas a child is just there and there's nothing they can really do. And, you know, I met I met lots of children who have lost their families, their loved ones, their friends, their schools had been blown up or whatever it might be, you know, real, real hard lives that these children live. And some of them have only, you know, they've been born in war and conflict zones and that's all they've ever known. You know, I, I can remember about 18 months ago, I was in Syria. And I, I met a child and, you know, there was a sort of large blast a couple of miles away. And I was sort of ex-military jumping on the floor, trying to get into cover away from, you know, this noise. And the child just carried on playing football. And I and I thought, you know, bloody hell, what's this, what's this kid doing? And then my interpreter who was with me said, Jordan, this is normal for them. They don't, they're not scared. This is, this is how they've grown up, you know, with bombs and bullets around them. And I just made me think you know what a what a tragic sort of state of affairs that a child doesn't even flinch when a when a bullet's being shot or a, a bomb's going off because that's all they know as normal and yeah the, the running dangerously project was about was about raising awareness and funds to try and provide opportunities for children in in iraq afghanistan and somalia so i decided to go back to those countries and and actually also to show people that these countries aren't full of bad nasty people because you know, sometimes you, you flick on the news these days, you, you, you look at the media or online and you Google Iraq or Afghanistan, Somalia, you will see a lot of negative stories. Uh, by default, you will see bombs, bullets, terrorists, Taliban, Al Qaeda and, and whatever else. But actually, that's a very small percentage of, of the people in those countries, you know, less than one percent probably actually. But they're the stories that make the headlines. And I wanted to show people that these countries are full of natural beauty. They're incredible, you know, places to go for an adventure. They're also full of amazing, warm, loving, hospitable people that, that, that they're just like me and you, you know, they, they want to do good. They want to go to work. They want to go home and have their food and love their family. They don't want war. And so for me, it was important to try and challenge certainly the Western perceptions of these countries, because, you know, in, in Afghanistan, it is probably one of the most beautiful countries in the world, you know, in, in, in certainly where I was in, in the Bamiyan province in central Afghanistan, it's got probably the be most beautiful national park that I've ever been to, um, you know, and we, we ran through it, people, we paddle boarded in there, amazing, you know, and, but people would never go there because it's, it's Afghanistan and it comes with the, the tarnish of the Western brush that, that, that says negative, you know, vibes, energy, but incredible countries, all three of them. Yeah, we had Nick Butter on recently and he ran a marathon in every country. And he said when he went into like Syria, he was sort of expecting this war-torn area. And he came into just such incredible hospi um, hospitality. And it's, it's that throughout the whole world. I did a trip a few years ago to, towards Afghanistan and sort of on the border. And people who have had on like Ava last uh, couple of weeks it's always the same, this incredible beauty and hospitality. And sometimes the Western media have sort of, as you say, tarnished 
the reputations of that country. So no matter what happens in the next sort of 10 years, everyone will associate those countries with war. I, I you know, I, when I came back from Afghanistan in particular, um, I did a news interview with the BBC and they, they sort of was running with the narrative that, you know, crazy adventurer running through the war zone and, and this. And they said, you know, you could have been killed. You could have done this, that and the other. And I said, I said, when I was in Afghanistan, I, n- nobody said anything bad to me. Nobody tried to hurt me. Nobody tried to attack me. But when I was on the tube on the way to your interview this morning, there was somebody with a knife that was threatening people, um, you know, in London. And for me, it's, it's you know, it's context is everything. And I, I travelled through Afghanistan without, you know, any real problems. Um, of course, there's always security concerns. Of course, we're always doing risk assessments. And of course, there are bad, bad hotspots. But, you know, I, I, I see more violence on the streets of London uh, than I saw on that particular trip of Afghanistan. Yeah, it was a story of a guy who, I can't remember his name, cycled around the world, you know, used to leave his bike everywhere where he went around the entire world. And then when he got back to the UK, left it, you know, just outside a shop to go and pick up some food and it was nicked within the first (laughs) 10 minutes. It sounds about (laughs) right, doesn't it? Uh, so yeah, I sort of I, what I what I love is this sort of idea of breaking down perceptions of other countries, which yeah usually get a sort of bit of a bad press. And so you raise quite a bit of money for those charities by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, um, you know, the charity sector is very interesting because I've, I've I've raised lots of money for lots of different courses causes over the years, but. I really, over the last few years, I've really drilled down into a sort of accountability. I want to know where every penny is going that I'm raising. You know, I I don't like this idea and I, to, to, to just collect money and hand it over to one of these large sort of almost corporate type charities that you don't really know if, if your funds are going to help or not. You just know that you've sent it to someone who should be sending it to the right place. And, and that really bugged me after the running dangerously project. You know, I, I was asking lots of questions and, and I really wanted to tell my donors, which, you know, have, have we built a new school? Have we provided resources? Have we funded some teachers? And, and some of the charities couldn't tell me that. They just said, it, you know, it goes into the big pot and we distribute it accordingly across several programs. And I just thought, you know, I understand that, but that's not good enough for me and, and the people that I want to be accountable to. So, you know, I, I, I ended up setting up with some trustees, a, a very small charity called Frontline Children. And that is a charity that's quite unique in some respect because we, we, we have no salaried staff, we don't take expenses, uh, and we know that every penny goes to where it needs to go. And we publish our accounts online and any donor who wants to interrogate any program or accounting is very welcome to. Um, so, you know, I, I really take a lot of pride that, 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 that every penny that I collect these days is going exactly where it should be going. Um, and, that, and that, you know, but, but at the same time, because we don't have any salaried staff and we rely completely on volunteers, our growth is very limited. We can only work on, on very small programs. But, you know, we've just built a school from scratch and that was incredible because that's three years of fundraising on the Horn of Africa to then go from you know, a piece of wasteland that was gifted as gifted to us by the government to then open in a school for up to 250 kids is all come through these adventures and people sponsoring them. And, and for me, that's really powerful because we've done that from nothing. We've not, you know, that's completely volunteers, amazing, kind public uh, people. And we, we've managed it ourselves and, and delivered it and handed it over to the government now, which is, which is, you know, we're super proud of that because that, that is really making a difference and, and having a, an impact in a certain part of the world. Well, it's amazing, you, you, as you say, with your adventures, there's such a sort of inspiring element to it. Because you've done some pretty crazy ones over the years, barefoot running across, uh, up Kilimanjaro. Yeah, yeah, we've done lots of, you know, it was a really interesting, that was that was probably my first real lesson in, in, in major fundraising, actually, because, you know, that, that particular story was, you know, probably six, seven years ago now. And I was... So two of my friends was asking if I wanted to come on a climbing expedition or a hiking, trekking expedition to Kilimanjaro. And they were raising money for a cancer charity at the time. And, you know, I was saying new to fundraising, but certainly new to major fundraising on a large scale. And I said, why don't we do things differently instead of just going up it like a lot of people do every year, hundreds, thousands maybe. 
why don't we do it barefoot and take our shoes off? And they obviously both looked at me like I was a bit crazy and a bit weird and, and said, no, Jordan, that's a silly idea. Um, well, I said, well, do you mind if I do that? You know, it wasn't my challenge. It wasn't my project as such. So I was, you know, didn't want to sort of in, intrude, but I'd been invited and I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to climb it barefoot and I'm going to give it a bit of a, an identity. I'm going to call it Barefoot Warrior, make a nice little logo and a website and see how it goes. And it raised nearly £70,000 and, and they walked alongside me and they raised, you know, a £1,000, I think, or £2,000, but a significantly lot less, but still an, an amazing amount of money. And I thought, all I did was the same as them, but with no shoes on. And I thought, so you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to have this super profile. You, you don't have to be a celebrity or anything like that to raise a lot of money. You've just got to think outside the box and, and do things differently. And that's where really everything has stemmed from that idea because, you know the, the the running dangerously or the rowing dangerously or the great british paddle these are these are all pretty simple things when you break them down you know if running dangerously i'm, I'm running a marathon but i'm doing it in another country but you know we, we make it sound sexy we make it sound appealing it attracts the media's attention and when you've got the media's attention you then have the the, the access to the masses of people so i i i try to look at a cycle and f so first you you build your project identity you know it needs a it needs a catchy name it needs a logo you know give it a website or give it a bit of branding and then what you do is you pitch it to the media and tell them what you're going to do because if you just go to the people that's a hard slog you know you're relying on on hundreds of spamming facebook posts all the time or or instagram or whatever but if you go to the media they do that job for you they tell the whole world about it so you know, I, I worked out this sort of recipe that, that you know, that, that I've used and, and seems to keep working. Um, of course, you've got to find something that often that has not been done before or, or that's been done before, but you're doing it with a twist or maybe it's a world record or a world first. And obviously they had a bit more appeal to the media because getting the media's attention is normally the hard bit. So that's why it's got to stand out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I use the same formula each time. Um, it's, it's not a secret. And and it tends to work, you know, and, and at the same time, if you cannot build your personal brand and profile alongside that, you can then start to attract corporates as well who, who also want exposure from the media. So, you know, it, again, it's finding things that work for everybody because then you speak to a corporate and you tell them I'm going to be on the BBC Sky News or Good Morning Britain or whatever it might be, and I'm going to wear your T-shirt or your cap. Everyone's winning because they're happy as well. So. You know, there's a there's a lot of as as you know as good as anyone. When you're doing these adventures, actually, the adventure itself is the easy bit. It's all the stuff that people don't see. It's the logistics. It's the media. It's it's the sponsorship, the donors, the charity stuff. That's the stuff that is the real hard slog that that people don't see. It's that it's that iceberg effect. You know, they just see that the, the flag at the end where you're celebrating or something. They don't see that the slog of, of of getting it done and get bringing it together. Yeah, it's usually the sort of adventures are the easy part. The sort of slog of as as you say asking people if you haven't got the media element is just i i personally find it just the the hardest part of it as you say with, with the adventure you've planned it you know it you are fit enough for it so you're like okay i think it's about relationships as well you know i i try to i spend a lot of time on 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 maintaining and 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 cultivating relationships with with brands with partners and and trying to over deliver to them trying to provide them more value than than, than they've been promised you know i think you know i i, I try to never promise that i'm going to give you a, a documentary or a book or you know a sky news interview but i go out my way to try and make that happen you know and I think they really appreciate that and they respect that and 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 then you, you're sort of over delivering on your on your promises which is what everyone wants in in, in commercial world or business they, they they want more than they pay for and you know and and that rely, being able to do that relies on on the strength of networks you know being able to reach out to a media organization or a brand and say this is what i'm doing can you help and and they will help because you've been spending a lot of time helping them in in, in the past and I think where a lot of people get it wrong in these circumstances is they they only go to people when they want something and that's a terrible human habit which a lot of people have they they go and ask somebody because you know they might not have spoke to that person for a year or two years or never at all but they've reached out because they want something from them as opposed to staying in touch with them seeing how they can help them you know somebody said to me many years ago that the, the, the real currency of networking is generosity. And it's something I try to live by. I try to, to help as many people as possible, to encourage, to support. You know, so sometimes people might want a, a little video or a, a quote and there's no harm in doing it. If they're doing it for a good cause, then why not? 
you know and, so, and, so, and, I, and I, I ask people i've asked several people recently can you can you provide a quote for a new book or a website some people say no some people don't reply and i, I just think well, why not it's for a good cause you, you're trying to do good in the world why, why not help somebody and, and I, I don't know why why not but for me if i can help somebody i will always help somebody if you're trying to do, do something good and i think i think the world is it's very reciprocal. If you try and do good, good things tend to happen and you don't have to worry about what you're going to get because it happens naturally. No, I, I completely agree with you on that. It Relationships are a huge part. And actually what I'm finding, especially by doing this podcast, is by just speaking to everyone, you learn so much and you're using your platform in order to get the sort of word out about other people. You know, I started the podcast because I thought it'd be really interesting to speak to people like yourself um, who I wouldn't otherwise you know during a lockdown would have ever have had the chance of bumping into and it's this sort of thing of just making trying to give use your platform for the, the good of you know inspiring other people massively I think it's huge I think and I would even go as far as to say that that to me personally where I am at this stage of my life is that's how I would measure success. It is it, success to me today is is very different than ten years ago. Success to me today is is how much of a positive impact can I have on the next generation's lives? And the more people I can positive, positively impact, the more successful I am. That that's how I, I measure my own success today. If I can inspire, if I can motivate, encourage, educate younger people, then for me, you know, I'm, I'm winning, and they're winning, and 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 we're all winning. So. Uh, absolutely. I uh, couldn't agree more. So you've had quite a interesting paddleboarding experience recently. This was paddleboarding around the, the UK or the British Isles. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a, I guess a world first attempt to paddleboard around mainland Great Britain. Um, I set off on the 26th of July, 2020, and was unfortunately brought to a halt on the 24th, 23rd of December 2020 after five months at sea. Um, unfortunately, the Scottish government and the First Minister decided that I would be in breach of COVID regulations to continue my paddle, which is which is cry, which is another story and another debate for another day because I was living on a support boat in the middle of the ocean. Um, but you know, I'm I'm I, 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 I genuinely I'm not I'm not bitter about that at all because we achieved our objective, which was to build a school and raise as much awareness, um, as much funds and inspire as many people as possible. So, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, there's nothing I could have done about that. And actually, when I when we received that message, to continue would have been doing the wrong thing and wouldn't have been leading by example. We've been asked by official authorities to stop. So that was what we did, you know. Um, a lot of people said you should have continued, you should have argued it, but I think it would have left a bit of sour taste in, in, in our mouths. We were asked to stop by the authorities, so we did as we were told. And and, and sometimes you've got to do what what the right thing to do is and not necessarily what you want in life. I think you learn as you as you get older. So, but yeah, what, what an incredible experience. I had an amazing team of people working with me throughout that. We paddled um, 2,377 kilometres over 149 days, seven hours and 33 minutes, which was longer than anyone's paddle boarded before on the open ocean. Um, so... We're incredibly proud of that, um, you know, that, that that adventure, that expedition, and as I say, most importantly, we raised an incredible amount of money. Um, and and for me, it was brand new. I'd never paddled on the ocean before I set off, so you know, I, I wanted to show people that you can you can do anything you want if as long as you believe it, you're prepared to work at it, and never give up. Most importantly, because you know there were lots of days when I wanted to give up and go home. Uh, you know, there's nothing pleasant about you know, dropping off the West Coast of Scotland at three in the morning in sub-zero temperatures, falling in the water, you know, uh, in the pitch black and you can't even see your board. Um, you know, you're only getting back on it because you're attached to it. It's It was an amazing adventure and I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, incredible. So what was the sort of root of that? Was that, where did you start from? So we started in in Essex in um, on Wallasey Island. We came out the the, the Thames estuary there and went south to Kent, along from Kent to Land's End. Um, from Land's End, we went uh, up towards North Devon, and then we crossed to Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel, um, Lundy Island to Milford Haven, South Wales. From South Wales, I paddled the probably one of the most difficult paddles, which was to cross the Irish Sea. Um, I crossed the Irish Sea to Ireland on my paddle board, and then I paddled up the Irish coast into Northern Ireland, and then paddled back across to the Mull of Kintyre in Scotland, 
up the west coast of Scotland, past the inner outer Hebrides, um, took a right at Cape Wrath um, in November, December, um, and then, yeah, headed towards John O'Groats and got to 23 kilometres short of John O'Groats uh, and was pulled up um, after five months um, and would have been the first bloke to, to have paddled from Land's End to John O'Groats, but it, it, was, it wasn't to be. And, you know, we, we, could have, we could have probably carried on another 23 kilometres, but it would have all have been about the record then. And I didn't want it to be about records. I wanted it to be about the purpose and the cause. And so it was important to, to go home. And also it was the day before Christmas. So stopping at that point after we got asked, instead of carrying on one more day, um, also allowed the whole team and the crew to go home to spend Christmas with their families, you know? So I, it, it was about, you know, doing the right thing and doing good things in the world. Not, not about, you know, trophy certificates or egos or anything like that. Yeah, it's quite something to be 20, 23 kilometres short, which would have been, what, a day? I know, well, very, very uh, noble of you to be like, we, we stop now. It's like sort of getting to 20 metres before Everest and being like, mm, I'm not feeling it. Let's go down, but... Well, it, well, it wasn't a case of not feeling it. It was, you know, we, we, we'd been asked and we were being tracked by the government, so... You know, we, as I say, we did the right thing. But also, um, uh, a friend of mine, Brendan Prince, he's currently out um, paddling around Great Britain. He's trying to to set the the, the the world record and break my my record of of longest ocean sub journey. So, uh, a, a, an incredible guy doing it for an amazing cause as well. So, I wanted to give him a shout out because um, he is he's about six weeks into his paddle. He's he's just going up sort of west coast of Wales, Pembrokeshire now, he set off from Torquay. So I really hope that Brendan does what I wasn't able to do. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, nobody supporting him more than I am. I'm a super fan and I hope that he gets around because he's, he's doing it for the right reasons and uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm sure he will be a great success. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as I say, November, December up in Scotland in the sea must have been pretty cold. <laughs> it was very cold. It was, it was. You know, I can remember we had a, a a good filmmaker, a great filmmaker with us, Alfie Marsh, and I can remember that he would he would sort of come into my cabin and shake me in my sleeping bag, and you know, my my beard was like frozen, my sleeping bag was frozen, and he and it was that horrible shake and said, Jordan, it's time. We're at the the RV point in the water, and it'd be it'd be like three four in the morning, and you couldn't see a thing. You were shivering, and then you had to put on a cold, damp wetsuit, and there's nothing <laughs> worse. And but you know that that was where I think you know, we talked about core values before, and one of the military's core values or the army's is discipline and. I think discipline is often a, a value and a character trait that is overlooked, especially in adventure, because discipline is so important when it comes to achieving your goals, because discipline for me is about still getting up and turning up and giving it your all, even when you don't want to, when you've had enough. And it's having that discipline, that routine to keep going and pushing forward. And I think discipline is a really important trait. And it's something that if it wasn't for discipline, I'd have, I'd have wrapped on it a long time ago you know um as we got into scotland there, there was many times when i wanted to quit and go home but you know it, it was it was discipline and remembering why we started that kept me going for sure yeah i think your why has to be really important no the biggest i think it's everything i think that's the difference between you know for me it's 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 People say, oh, why, why, do, why do you do the marathons in the war zones or why do you row across dangerous straits of ocean or, you know, why paddle around the UK? But actually, if someone said to me I could raise a quarter of a million dollars by running a 5K park run, I'd be much happier doing that because that's a lot easier. I get to go home at the end of it and see my family, my daughter. But actually, you need to do pretty epic things if you're going to raise pretty epic amounts of money unfortunately that's 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 the be all and end all you know if if, if you want to be a serious fundraiser on a you know you have to have a powerful why and a strong story to go with it and the you know w w there's a lot of very incredible inspiring people out there and, and they're pushing the boundaries all the time you know a good friend of mine uh, nims die you know with his his, his mountaineering and his 14 eight um eight thousand meter peak records that is it's just insane, you know, the level of endurance, the the bar just keeps getting higher and higher from these incredible, you know, athletes, adventurers, inspiring people. And um, so, so you, you know, the more the more barriers that are pushed, the further and harder we've all got to work, you know. <laughs> and I suppose what I loved about your story is the sort of connection which has sort of led you to where you are today with your charity work, with your presenting, because... <laughs> I remember reading about how you got 
the job at Hunted for Channel 4, which was just this sort of course which you had done in the army, which no one really wanted to do. But that somehow led to you <laughs> getting this job. Yeah, I, I, I served in a, in, a, in a cavalry regiment, in a tank regiment. Um, but when we went on operations, there would be <clears throat> opportunities to go and do certain courses. Um, I went and specialised in some intelligence courses, um, in, in tactical questioning, um, prisoner handling and dealing, you know, get, providing briefings to... Uh, troops on the ground using processing intelligence and things like that and yeah 10 years later I, I got a phone call from a producer saying that um we, we've seen that you've completed this course um would you be interested we're looking for someone with ex-military intelligence experience would you be interested to to do an interview and a screen test and I was like yeah yeah of course I would <laughs> <laughs> um and that was that really and you know it's a, a great opportunity I'm, I'm I'm not a big fan of um, of reality TV, to be com- completely honest. I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, but what I do like about that particular program, and it gives, it, it helps with the charity stuff. You know, people um, people support, people are big fans of the show. They they love the, the show. It is, it is, is, it's great entertainment. Um, it's great fun. But it also allows me to use my profile of Hunted to do some good in the world. So I, I, I think that's um, why I enjoy it so much, because... It's nothing more frustrating when you go and speak to a, 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 a business or a school or a college and, and you want to talk about one of these amazing adventures that you've just finished. And all they want to know is what was it like when you caught this person off Love Island or Big Brother or whatever? And you're like, no. <laughs> what the, the, what, what children love these days. <laughs> yeah, do you know, it's, 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 it's. It's tough as well because I, I I was in assembly the other day with a school um, in Wiltshire and I asked the kids you know some of the kids I asked them what do you want to be when you're older and it's it's scary they want to be they want to be YouTubers they want to be Instagram models they they want to be influencers you know it's I'm scared for the next generation you know the the internet does a lot of good but also it's it's changing the way people think and it's it's concerning for me. Um, you know, t- 20 years ago, 10 years ago, people wanted to be astronauts. They wanted to be scientists. They wanted to be inventors. Now they want to be famous, which is is, is not good, I don't think. I don't, Scary. I, th- I think, uh, yeah, definitely sort of moving towards that. I'm trying to sort of think of what I wanted to be. I think I wanted to be a football player. <laughs> yeah, I sort of feel like my time has passed now. I'm sort of the same age of James Milner, who's probably getting to the end. So I'm a bit like, uh, okay. <laughs> if you're going to influence influence good things positive things inspire educate inform i think you know don't sell your soul for you know a cap or a new food product that's just come out i think i just i just think there's a it's probably one of my biggest gripes in life at the moment i think i think that people who have a profile or have a large following of any sort they should have a responsibility and be accountable to to deliver good things to the world because do you know, is it's scary because you you can go on one of these reality shows and you can you can have more influence than a mainstream politician. You know, people who have come out of things like Love Island have more followers than the prime minister, and that means more people are probably listening to them and and being influenced by what they say. And I just think if you if you are an influencer, you know, I challenge you, I question you to to, to be accountable to the message you're pushing out there to young people. I think it's important. Well, Jordan, um, thank you so much. Uh, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Uh, with the first being, on your trips and expeditions, what's the one thing or gadget that you always take with you? Oh, good question. Um, one thing that I always take with me, uh, and this is not a plug, I'm not paid, uh, is a, a water-to-go bottle. Um, that you know the the filtration bottles um, so I always carry a water to go bottle in my day sack um, again you know water is an integral part of staying alive uh, so if you can find especially when you're in some of these far-fetched places of the world um, in, in jungles and rivers and things um, incredible piece of kit and you know I, I take that everywhere in my in my day sack. Oh, nice what about your favorite adventure or travel book? I think um, Lev Wood um, Leverson Wood does a lot of great, he's a great travel writer, uh, does some some brilliant stuff, you know, some of his walks through the Himalayas, the Arabian Peninsula, um, really good, captivating books. Um, I enjoyed, when I was paddling around Great Britain, I enjoyed reading Fiona Quinn's book um, about her Land's End to John O'Groats um, Sup. 
Um, that was good because I, I I would use it for reference points. I would check where what she was thinking and experiencing when I was at that part of of, of the country. So that was a, that was a good read for me. Um, but yeah, no, lo- lots of incredible books out there. Uh, Ash Dykes, uh, another great adventurer. Uh, he has a great bush, uh, a great a great book out. I'm trying to think of the name. It Mission Possible, I think it was. Yeah, yeah re- re- good guy, good friend of mine. Um, very inspiring. Why are adventures important to you? I think for me, the the adventure itself, it's, 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 it, it, it's, dare I say, it's not that important. It's the reason why we're doing the adventure. What's important, you know, it's, it's what, what we can learn from it, what we can share from it. That's what's important. Um, I also think that people should understand that you don't need to go to the other side of the world or do something, you know, crazy to have an amazing adventure. Adventure is a mindset. Adventure is about changing the way you think. It's about changing your approach to everyday life. You know, you, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, you don't have to travel far. You can have an adventure anywhere. Some of the best adventures in lockdown were in my back garden with my daughter. You know, it's it's it, it's a spirit that you have within you, I think. Um, what about your favorite quote? Oh, my God, I have so many quotes. Uh, <laughs> But I'm like a, a walking encyclopedia of quotes. What I, 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 I'll give you a quote, but I, I wouldn't like to say it's my favourite because I, I got too many. But I think one of the quotes I like at the moment is, um, is oh, I want to give you one now. Um, I think I would say, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Um, but I also like one. I, I, I give someone a quote yesterday. I'm trying to think of what it was. Um, the toughest roads often lead to lead to the most beautiful destinations. Uh, I, like, I like that one. Um, oh, but there's so many. I love the man in the arena. Um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, man in the arena um, quote passage. Um, I've had that. I had that on the back of my paddle board and I had it on my, my boat for my row. Um, it was something that, you know, I, I, I really like the concept of that, you know, if you're not in the arena getting your, your butt kicked, you know, at the time, then the people who are having opinions on you don't really have the right to, or the privilege to. So, you know, I, I remember when I set off on the, on the paddle board, people were telling me I wouldn't get to Land's End. You would never cross the Irish sea. You wouldn't make it up to Scotland. Nobody's been around Cape Wrath in the winter. It's impossible. You don't have the experience, the knowledge, the skills um so uh, you know it always makes me smile that man in the arena quote because everyone has an opinion from you know what i call the cheap seats which is social media uh, everyone's got an opinion on everything haven't they <laughs> armchair, armchair critics. critics yeah absolutely yeah I, I remember my first trip to america and i'd never been so i was getting people's opinion and a lot of people were giving me opinions of like oh pennsylvania is a really dangerous place place you know and they were sort of giving me these sort of scare stories about once upon a time this happened and actually one they had actually never been to that part of the world they'd only heard about it once in a blue moon and secondly when i went there it was absolutely nothing like people had sort of made out it was just full of really welcoming and friendly people and from then on i suddenly realized that most people don't really have a clue what they're saying at the best of times and people love to give their opinion and of course there are opinions which you know you should always take take into account but i just remember thinking wow you know everyone gave me these horrific scare stories of america and the reality was that they were some of the most hospitable people i've ever experienced in my travels yeah and the same i think the same everywhere in the world in afghanistan iraq somalia I, I, I saw more compassion, love, support than I've ever seen, you know, and these are from people who a lot of people perceive to, to be negative types of people, which is, it's incredible. I think, you know, when I worked in intelligence, we were constantly evaluating uh, information and the source of that information. And I, I use that same sort of process with feedback and people's opinions. I, you know, if someone's got an opinion on whatever you're doing, firstly, you know, What's the source? Who are they? Where do they come from? Have they done what you're trying to do? Um, how credible are they? And, and secondly, do they know you? Have they, did, you know, they've never walked your path. They've never you know, walked your, your shoes for a day. So they don't know what you're thinking, what you're doing. And often people make judgment without knowing the facts in this world. As you say, the sort of armchair critic who sort of gives the negative feedback on social media. And I, w- I always think someone, uh, I think he is Gary Vaynerchuk, or you said, you know, don't listen to the positive and then you'll know not to listen to the negative. And no matter what comes at you, it's just noise. 
Yeah. Well, well, it's, it's 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 hard. I think I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that because I think feedback is important, but you've just got to make sure that what you're processing and letting come in is 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 going to help you grow. It's going to help you develop. It's going to you know because when when you're when you when I when I'm doing a, an adventure and you're getting lots of loving supporting messages, you take a lot of strength from that as well. You know, when when you've got people who sponsored you or donated or sent you a lovely Facebook Instagram message, you, you know, you, you take a lot of positives that you're inspiring people. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think feedback is important and and engaging with people is really important. So I, I don't think you should just sort of blank out anything good or bad. I think, <laughs> you know, I I I, I, I think feedback is is. He's champion, really. I suppose what I meant was when when you have a hundred positive messages and you get that one, very easy for people to sort of look at that one and be like, why have they said that? Why? It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, definitely. Why Why have they decided to say that? It's sort of, you know, but you've got like two or three hundred really positive messages and you're like, why? why have they decided to say this? Yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult as well if, if you're not used to that. And, you know, you see it with trolls and things on the internet, don't you? You know, it's people always, you know, with faceless keyboard warriors, they've always got an opinion on something and they've, you know, never left their, their, their mum's spare bedroom or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Uh, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand expeditions. What's the one thing you would recommend for people wanting to get started? Oh, you just got to go for it. You know, I, I don't always have the master plan. I don't always have it all worked out for me. I, I, I see something and I, I make it happen. You, you, you know, my dad used to say there are, there are talkers and there are doers in life and, and there are a lot more talkers than there are doers. And, you know, if you want something, go out there and get it. And you've got to be relentless in pursuit of it as well. You know, it, it, things don't come easy in life. You know, you, you've got to make sacrifices. You've got to work hard. You've got to save up. You've got to engage with people. But if you want it, go make it happen. You know, the only thing that's stopping you is you. You know, you know, you're the person who is, is is putting it on hold. You're the person who's stuck in that that job that you don't want to be in. You're the person that's sat in the you know on the computer all the time. Get out there and go for it. Yeah. And finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in the future? Uh, so yeah, lots of exciting adventures. Although at the moment I'm nursing an Achilles injury, so I'm I'm pretty static at the moment, but I'm due to be I'm due to be on the Isle of Skye in four weeks' time with uh, Montaigne doing some filming um, for some new new products. Um, I am in Antarctica in December. Uh, I'm at the North Pole in April next year. So lots of exciting things going on. I just need my my Achilles to heal at the moment. And yeah, please follow the adventures. My socials at Mr. Jordan Wiley on all platforms and jordanwiley.org is the website. Amazing. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on today. No, absolute pleasure. Uh, keep up the great work. Um, it's it's a, it's an awesome platform uh, telling some great stories. I, I, I'm i a fan and I certainly listen to it. So keep up the good work, mate. Well, thank you very much. And we look forward to following your adventures in the sky, Antarctica and the North Pole. Yeah, definitely. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.